I don't have a problem with Michael Gove wanting to redraft British history. By all means, do your job as the education secretary. Yet the elision of this nation's national identity presents ethnic minorities as invading this country the same way the soldiers did the Garden of Gethsemane. I see that history begins on a sheet of paper, but whilst you can be British Indian or British Chinese, when it comes to a box that could potentially define me, all I see is black British. I don't even have a country. My father's people, they have this thing, they call it an oriki. It's a catalogue of an individual's family history. And as I look in the mirror and wonder what Michael Gove really wants to see, I realise that I am the best example of this nation's identity. I look at my hands as they flutter across my eyes, drawing maps that are comprised not of hubristic perspectives or imperialistic enterprises, creamed with a mercantilism that feeds pirates' lives. My hands tell a story. And though the palms appear white, the other side is bronze and shimmers in the golden lights that speak of the untold stories that helped our flag to fly. I write with my grandmother's hands. But these hands did not pluck sugar cane from the slave plowed land. One, pure white as the snowflakes my mother never understood that were described in Enid Blyton's books. She was a secretary, daughter to the chief superintendent of the Bristol Police Constabulary, married a surgeon and signed on to interracial marriage before Martin even dared to have a dream. The other hand that crossed my words is three shades darker than the granddaughter's poems she has never heard. It traded in gold across Yoruba land, fried Accra treats and pounded yam in the Ijebude heat beneath the cocoa yam bushes and the cola nut. She spoke the language of the colonizers. I write with my grandmother's hands, but these hands did not pluck sugar cane from the slave plowed land. Why is it that when I wanted to study history GCSE, all that was on offer was the Middle Passage or World War II, we assume that every black Britain or via the wind rush under the pretense of streets paved in gold. Yet, when I walk the streets of Wembley, all that greets my eyes are the quat-stained pavements that look like the blood spatter pattern in Jerry Bruckheimer's CSI. Yet this elision of my national identity is indeed a crime scene investigation, and the education curriculum is the culpable one. In 1796, Mungo Park found his way to the Niger River following the tributaries that would later designate tribes, destroying nations as a precursor to imperially imposed national boundary lines. It was a decade before the abolition of the slave trade. Yet when I was 14, the only names I knew in relation to Africa were William Wilberforce and Kunta Kinte. We never learnt about the scramble for Africa, but when I check out Wikipedia, it tells me it was the invasion, occupation, colonization, and annexation of African territories by European powers. It was the 18th century. Britain, France, Germany, Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands were creating political hegemonies on a soil that was not their own, that had political infrastructures they didn't even take the time to get to know. When I look at British history, I realize it is not as pure as Michael Gove wants it to be. Quintessentially British is not English tea because those leaves were farmed in India. It is bizarre that we forget that this nation is founded on a politically reformed history. I stood in a military cemetery in Ypres on a history trip about the Battle of the Somme. It was the first time I realized it was called a world war because so many mother's sons had died for the liberty and freedom we only seem to accord the white ones. I never learnt that there were regiments from Jamaica, Gambia, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Ghana and Nigeria and yet even though the colour bar was lifted and we were all against Hitler, racial discrimination still existed. That's why we don't think of them in November when we are forced to remember. You see, Britain is a conglomerate of many nations. Don't just think the Commonwealth belongs to the Australians and the Canadians. 
Britain, like all countries, has a pirate history and it cannot be washed away under the disguise of Indian railroads and democracy, its international exploits locked away in colonial mortuaries where reams of papers lie rotting, their words eroded, and if we don't catch them, the history books will soon be reworded. I represent the mixed race and the ethnic minorities. I am the daughter of a murdered history, sister of a butchered identity, and though I now study social anthropology, I will have my history GCSE in this decade or the next for what we do in the classroom echoes in Westminster's bench. I know that nations are tiny kernels, as fragile as a flower seed that is sown into the pores of a growing human being, but I know that a seed needs bees to be pollinated. The flower blooms because of all the activities that are unseen as that sweet fragrance wafts across your nose, reminding you of romance and the war of the roses. But I write with my grandmother's hands. And these hands did not pluck sugar cane from the slave plowed land, rather the brown that laces the white exposes the same story I wish to bring to light as my grandmother's hands caress me. I stand firm in the memory that Britain has a colonial history that like my English grandmother is married to its former colonies and it is rich, so long as we don't reduce it to a caricature identity. You see, I write with my grandmother's hands, but these hands did not pluck sugar cane from the slave plowed land, rather they were free. And that is why I can stand here today and tell you about Britain's untitled Oriki. The poem, thank you, the poem I just performed is called Grandmother's Hands. And I wrote it as a response to the conventional telling of British and, in a sense, world and European history. Now, as a child of the diaspora, I am constantly confronted with two things. One of them is a history that begins and ends in slavery, and the other is an awkward pause that happens whenever somebody tries to pronounce my name. So I know that Malachi had a go earlier on, and growing up, I was actually called Cain Day. Kende is the name that the Yoruba people of Western Nigeria give to the second born of twins. It means the one that comes behind. Whilst Taiwo is given to the first born, and that means first to taste the world. However, I think as some of us acknowledged earlier, and some people here might have hard to say names, when you do have a name that begins with a K, has a H in the middle, and an N near the end, often people struggle to say it correctly. So I was called Kehindi, Kahind, Kende, Candy, Silence, and sometimes, do you have another name because this one is a bit too difficult to pronounce? <laughs> but you see, names, names and narratives don't really work that way. I mean, imagine for a moment if Harry Potter was called Gary Potter. Just wouldn't really be the same thing. And the reason for that is that names affect narratives. When we remove people's names, we remove their histories and their stories. You see, I never grew up learning about the name Lord Frederick Lugard or colonization. Even though we studied the crown jewels, we never looked at colonial rules. Once a year, Martin and Malcolm said hello, but somebody like Ignatius Sancho, never heard of. Some of these people's names are difficult to pronounce, just like some histories are difficult to stomach. So why should we bother trying to pronounce them correctly? Why should we bother trying to tell these stories properly? My response to that is because when you doctor history, you jeopardize humanity. I want to tell you the story of a man whose desire and hunger for power was so great that it led to the murder of millions of people. And I'm not talking about Hitler. King Leopold of Belgium's colonial regime saw the murder of between 2 and 15 million Congolese people. At its maximum, that death total is more than double the Holocaust. His regime began half a century before World War II. 
but I wonder how many of us know his name. A good story isn't always an easy read. It is difficult sometimes to deal with history. But if we are to be a people and a generation that brings about progress, then we can't reduce a whole book to one chapter. We can't reduce a whole cast of people into one character. If history is the map that shows us where we are going, then we need to make sure that we read it correctly. No matter how uncomfortable, how difficult, or how foreign the territory. What are the stories that you are willing to tell? What are the stories that you are waiting to hear? Because if you don't begin narrating your own life story, someone else is going to do it for you. And believe me, they're not going to do it right. You see, it's only when we are secure in our history and therefore our identity that we can move from tiny, tiny sparks of potential into forest fires that blaze brightly, emancipated and empowered. Thank you.